Okay, folks, so we're wrapping up our discussion of diffusion, and in particular what we're going to do now is look at um, trying to simulate models on uh, networks and using that to, to match actual data and to see what we can say about uh, what we can learn from that kind of uh, exercise. So we'll explicitly model diffusion and then uh, study it. And um, so we're, we're doing a fitting uh, thing, and, and what I'm going to talk about is recent work that I've been doing um, with Abhijit Banerjee, Arun Chandra Sikhar, and Esther Duflo. And actually this study we started in, I guess, around 2006. Um, we started gathering data around 2007 and have gathered data for some years now. And um, this is, is uh, part of the study that's come out of this. And um, what we did was we mapped networks in a series of villages in Karnataka in, in southern Idi India. and. Um, then uh, there was a uh, bank that came in and, and started offering um, loans, and we traced the diffusion of participation in those loans over time. And uh, so we can fit a diffusion model because we actually know the explicit networks, um, and then uh, we can uh, talk about how the diffusion process works. Okay. Um, so we observed. Uh, many different networks and, and we'll try and study these things. And, and the questions that we're, we're, we can look at here and in terms of, of what can we learn from this kind of uh, uh, analysis and exercise are that there's several things. So, so one is um, in, in this kind of process when people were hearing, so in, these are small villages, uh, relatively isolated villages, um, People are fairly poor, so the per capita income in these villages is uh, on the order of a, a dollar per day or, or several dollars per day per capita. Um, the villages were ones that did not have access to loans before, so people now can, can hear about loans and then have access to them. And uh, there's sort of two things that might determine what a given household decide, um, a given household's decision in terms of, of deciding whether to take out one of these microfinance loans. One is, did I hear about it? So just the pure diffusion process of, am I aware that there's a, a micro lender coming into these to my village? And this is not a, a you know in, in these villages it's not easy to, to to just advertise. It's not as if everyone has televisions or, or radios or uh, um, telephones. So the the diffusion is actually by word of mouth. So the bank would come into a given village, um, tell a series of people, um, say 10 people in, in, in a given village, it talked to, to 10 individuals, and we know who the, the first, the list of first individuals that they were supposed to contact was. And once they go in and talk to those individuals, then they would say, okay, spread the word. So we'll be back in a couple of weeks, tell your friends that um, we're going to be back and offering loans and um, they can come to a meeting in two weeks and learn more about it. And then as people came, they could say, okay, tell your friends and so forth. And so things would diffuse by word of mouth um, through the villages. And so uh, then once I hear about uh, the availability of this, then there's a question of what determines whether I take up. Is it the fact that I just have to know about it? Or then do I actually also pay, a, pay attention to what my friends are doing? So if I have four friends who've also heard about it and uh, three quarters of them end up taking out loans, does that make me more likely to do this than if just say one out of four of my friends takes it up? Okay, so are there pure effects? Is there some sort of interaction, complementarity? Is there really sort of a game on the network going on where I care about what my neighbors are doing? Or is it just that I have to hear about it and once I hear about it, then that's enough to get me to go out and, and uh, make my decision. Okay, so that's one part. And another part is that in this kind of setting, different from the kinds of models we've been studying so far, it could be that even if I decide not to take out a loan, for some reason I say I don't need a loan um, or I don't want a loan, uh, the interest is too high or I don't, I don't want one right now, I could still tell one of my other neighbors, oh look, I just heard from so-and-so that there's a bank coming to our village and they're going to be offering loans. So it's still possible that I could pass information along. And one question is, are non-participants important? Okay. So to answer these kinds of questions, we're going to have to, to actually build models. So we'll take a, a, an explicit model of, of uh, diffusion, and um, we'll, we'll have models of diffusion and behavior, fit them to the actual networks that we've observed, see what happens, and, and uh, try and match the data.
Okay. So, um, basic idea here is we know the initially uh, which nodes are initially informed. Um, these informed nodes repeatedly pass information randomly to their friends over discrete time. So the simple model is just going to be people talk to each other. You bump into see your friends randomly. You talk to them. You tell them if you know. Um, once you become informed, and we'll just do this once. So once I hear about it, then I decide, do I want to be a person who takes up one of these loans or not? Okay? You could enrich the model and have people decide over time. Um, that's not going to change much in, in what we see. Um, so nodes choose to participate depending on their characteristics and their neighbor choices. So we can take into account the fact that nodes have different characteristics. So some of the nodes have higher income, some have more education, some are of one caste, some are of uh, different castes. Um, some, you know, so, so there's a whole series of things that might determine uh, whether they take out uh, a given loan. And so we'll condition on their characteristics, which is going to affect their decision, and we'll allow their decision to be based on their neighbor's choices. Okay, so now we're going to be very explicit about modeling the diffusion process in, in detail and then seeing what happens. Okay, so in terms of the background of the villages here, there were 75 villages that were initially identified that the bank was planning on going into, relatively isolated um, from microfinance. BSS, this uh, micro lending organization, eventually went into 43 of them and started offering loans. We surveyed the villages before they entered and uh, observed the network structure and various demographics, and then we tracked the microfinance participation over time. So given the initial nodes, then we can see who took up microfinance at which points in time, so we then can trace the, the diffusion. So the, the nice thing about this data set is it's a unique data set. Now, every data set is somewhat unique. But what's nice about this data set is that um, here we have 43 different networks, and we'll treat each village as, as if it's just a closed um, society. There's not much interaction between these villages. They're actually reasonably uh, far apart, and there weren't marriages, intermarriages between the villages we were looking at at, at very high rates. So we'll treat them as, as a closed um, village, so 43 different networks. And given that we have 43 different networks, we can then say, okay, is, what, what is it about what's going on here um, in terms of diffusion? Because we've got a series of different observations of the same process operating on each of these different networks. So then we've got this coupled together with the economic behavior over time, um, which is something which you don't find in many data sets where you've got lots of different networks. And in each, each network, we've, each uh, village, we've got a lot of different information. So we have 13 different types of relationships, a lot of uh, information about profession, caste, uh, gender, education, all kinds of things. Um, we know the geography of the villages, so we have uh, G, uh, GPS coordinates. We know which points were initially informed. And then this combination of everything then allows us to trace out a diffusion model and see what's going on. Okay, so Karnataka, southern India, actually mostly within a couple hundred kilometers of uh, Bangalore, so within a few hours of Bangalore. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we asked a series of different questions in these villages, and so this would be um, one of the typical villages. Um, and uh, to, to blow this up, if you had to borrow um, 50 rupees for a day, who would you go to? And again, um, Things are clustered. This would be one particular household, and then arrows from them to another are, are naming who would they go to to borrow um, 50 rupees for a day. So you can see there's actually arrows on the end of some of these things. So um, you know, some one household is saying they're going to borrow from another household. So we're going to aggregate things and just treat households as nodes. So we'll aggregate across a household. Um, there's a lot more information about this I'm not going to go into. If you want to go to, to you can find uh, uh, papers, the data set, um, some of the code that we used here on my, my website. So there's a lot more information than I'll have time for in, in terms of the details of how this was all done. But basically what we're going to do is aggregate up and treat a, a household as a node because they were limited to one loan per household. So it's basically a household decision of whether you take out a loan. And these loans were given uh, uh, to women between 18 and 57, and only one woman per household can take out a loan at a time. Um, and then we have other questions. You know, who do you go to temple with? Um, who do you ask for? Uh, who do you go to to ask for advice? Um, who comes to you to borrow kerosene? Who do you go to for medical help? And all these things. So we'll aggregate up and treat uh, 
two households as connected if they've any connection in any one of these. So um, uh, this allows us then to have uh, um, a measure of, of the possibility of contacting each other so they could talk to each other if, if they have any of these types of interactions. Okay, so now the diffusion process. So what we're going to do is we're going to track things over time in terms of the information diffusion. And the participation decision, so people are going to decide whether or not to participate in this program based on their demographics and what their neighbors are doing. So let's first start with how a, a given household decides on whether it's going to take out a loan, and then we'll back up and look at the diffusion process. Okay? So once I'm informed, I've just heard, okay, um, there's a meeting, uh, you can go to the meeting, um, and now I decide, you know, do I really want to go? Do, am I interested in participating in this, in this loan program? Okay, so the, the choice can depend on my personal characteristics, right? So it can depend on, on am I a, a farmer? Is my household doing farming? Are we doing textiles? Are we raising silkworms? Um, there's a series of different things that, that people do in these villages, and we could, might, our decision might depend on that. It might also depend on how many of our neighbors ended up taking up. Okay? So th there's actually two different ways in which it might matter. So one is that there's some sort of, um, I, I see more of my neighbors taking it up, and I think, oh, that's, that tells me that this is a good idea. There's some learning effect. So more of my neighbors participating saying, well, it's more likely it's a good thing for me to do. Um, it could also be that I just imitate people in some sort of peer pressure. Um, it could also be that uh, you know, these loans actually people were put into groups and, and um, there's some mutual default uh, provisions in these loans. It could be that I'm interested in being in, uh, in a group with, with some of my friends. Um, on, on the other hand, you could have a substitution effect. So it could be that if my friends start taking out loans, then I decide, no, I don't want to because I can just borrow from them. So these loans are actually fairly large for these households. They're, they're on the order of 10,000 rupees a year. So that's something that I, I might say, oh, well, you know, now I know somebody who's got one of these loans. I'm not going to do it myself. I'll just borrow from them. So we could imagine that, that people's decisions could depend on either, in either direction on what their neighbors are doing. So we'll model that explicitly. So how are we going to do this? Um, we'll model this logistically. So let's let um, PI be the probability that a given household I decides to participate. Okay? And what we'll do is just have a, a simple logistic regression so that the log of the probability that you participate compared to you not participate, so PI over 1 minus PI, um, is going to depend on some constant plus it's going to depend on your characteristics, so we'll keep track of your education level, your profession, a whole series of other things, so it can depend on all those, and it can also depend on when I look at the fraction of people that I know who I've talked to and are also um, out there and, and know about this loan, um, how many of them are participating, so what's the fraction of those that are participating, okay? So if this is positive, then there's a learning effect or a peer effect, a positive effect, if it's negative, then it might be that there's a substitution effect that I'm going to free ride off them. If they take up loans, then I don't need to. Okay? So this is the effect which captures sort of things beyond being informed, but do I pay attention to my friends, um, what my friends are doing in deciding whether or not I'm going to participate. Okay, so um, now let's model the diffusion process. So let's explicitly model diffusion. And we're going to do that by looking at um, given household, what's the probability that they talk to their friends, their other households they know, about the microfinance? And what we'll do is, if they are a household that decided not to participate, then they're going to talk with some rate we'll call Q super N. If they did participate, then they'll talk with some probability Q super P. So, Though we, we allow for different probabilities of people talking or infecting other individuals depending on whether they are participants or not participants themselves. Okay? So this is now different from our standard contagion models that we've been looking at till now where you had to actually uh, be a, a one in order to transmit. Um, now I can, I can uh, still not participate and still tell my friends. So we'll allow these two probabilities to differ. So how's the model going to work? 
Well, um, we know the initially informed nodes, so we'll call these people leaders. So those are the first people that the bank talked to in a given village. So it talked to say, let's just look at a, a, a snapshot of, of one of the villages. Let's suppose that these are two different households that the bank first talked to. Okay, so these are two of the leaders. And then the ones that are not colored in are nodes that were not talked to initially. Okay, and let's suppose that for whatever reason, one of these is a household for which they like the loans, they participate. The other one is a household which does not like the loans and, and doesn't think they want one and does not participate. Okay, so that starts the process. And now we're just going to model the diffusion. So we know what the network looks like, we know who they talk to, and these people are going to are going to talk to their friends with probability QP. These people are going to talk to their friends with probability QN. So the first period arises. These randomly, um, each one of these friends gets talked to with probability QN. Each one of these friends gets talked to with probability QP. And so um, in this case, if say QP is higher than QN, then this household would have talked to three different neighbors. This household talked to one neighbor. So now we've got these individuals who all know about microfinance, right? So we've got a new set. And now this set of individuals makes decisions. So they decide whether to participate or not. So in this case, this one decided to, this one decided to, this one decided to, this one decided not to, okay? And, and now when they're making their decisions, we're taking into account the fact that this household had a friend who did not participate in so, so when they're making their decision, we look at their demographics plus the fact that they had a friend who had decided not to participate. All of these individuals, when they're making their decision, they have a friend who did participate, right? And so that will allow us to begin to see how a household's decision depends on whether their friends participate or not. Okay? And now we'll just repeat this process. So now where's the simulation? So the simulation is we randomly pick some neighbors, they make decisions, okay? Then we randomly... People tell their neighbors again, so this person can still keep talking. They tell two more neighbors. This individual ends up telling a neighbor. This individual ends up telling a neighbor. Um, also talked to by this, so this person heard from two different people. Um, this person tells two neighbors. So the information ended up uh, continuing. We got more passing going on. These new people now look at their demographics, their, they make a decision based on their characteristics plus what their friends are doing, um, and then so forth, okay? So the estimation technique here is we can begin to um, see how things depend on uh, characteristics, basic characteristics and so forth, this logistic regression. Um, we, can, uh, we can do that directly from the first informed nodes that have no neighbors taking up. Um, and that actually just to help in terms of computation, so we can estimate those things. The interesting parameters that we're really interested in are what's the probability that I tell my friends if I'm not a participant? What's the probability that I tell my friends if I am a participant? What's this peer influence factor? And so the way that we're actually going to estimate those things is for each choice of parameters, right? So we can search on a grid. We can start and say, let's look at QN equals... 0, 0.1, 0 0.2, etc., up to, to 1. We can have uh, QP vary from 0 to 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, etc., all the way up to 1. Then we can set B peer, for instance. We can pick a range for that, say minus 5, minus 4, etc. The exact details on the grid are in the, the paper. Um, so we, we, we'll search over a grid, and for each combination, then we can say, okay, what would happen if, it was, if QN was 0, QP was 0.2, and B peer was minus 4? Okay? So for those values, we simulate the model. We just run the model as if people did that. So then we have, for these different parameters, we can, we can calculate probabilities that everybody will participate, probabilities that they tell their friends. We simulate the model out. That leads to an eventual number of people who participate and a distribution of people based on characteristics and so forth. So for each one of these different sets of parameters, we get <clears throat> a picture of what happens. And so then what we'll do is we're going to choose the parameters that best match the simulated data to actually what goes on in the observed data. 
right? So we'll, we'll, we'll match the simulated data to the observed data and pick the parameters which make those closest. And in particular, we use what's called generalized method of moments, which, or in this case, simulated method of moments, or, um, is, is uh, a way of, of taking these um, estimates and trying to make sure that we match, for instance, the average participation rate. So can we get the average participation rate? Can we get the variance right? Can we get the um, participation rates of the leaders correctly or people from a distance one? So we can look at a whole series of different measures of what actually happened in the data and then look at the simulations and then try and match up those measures. Um, so you can use five or six different measures depending on you know the, uh, how accurate you want to be and so forth and how much uh, the simulation. Uh, so there's um, uh, the, okay so, so, so we'll, we'll search over the grid, try and match the different parameters and then see what we end up with. Okay. So what do we end up with? Um, so the conclusions we find information passing turns out to be significant. This B peer um, turns out not to be significant. So when you look at the full model with everything in it, what do you get in terms of estimations? The best fitting, the QN, which best matches the uh, observed data to the simulated data is um, 0.05. So a given individual who decides or household decides not to participate tells friends on average about one out of 20 um, times on each of these repetitions, whereas QP turns out to be 0.5. So you get a half. Um, so there's much more likely, 10 times more likely if you're a participating household um, to tell neighbors about it than a non-participating household. Um, both of these are significant at the 99% level. So if you look at the standard errors on these estimates, which are gotten from, from basically um, f going through the simulations and going through variations of picking different villages, so bootstrapping, um, you can calculate standard errors. I'm not going to go through the statistical details of calculating standard errors here, um, but you can read about that in, in the paper if you're interested. And so what we end up with is a situation where we have um, different QN and QP, and uh, we end up with uh, the difference between these two being highly significant, and interestingly, what the estimate of B-peer turns out to be um, slightly negative. It's insignificant, so it's not significantly different from zero, um, but it, doesn't, it certainly doesn't appear that we're getting a strong positive effect or a significant positive effect. If anything, the coefficient is actually negative, and it's insignificant. So we can drop that out. It's insignificant, re-estimate the model, and then when you re-estimate the model, you get slightly different parameters, um, but we're still getting something which is highly significant. Um, QP looks about seven times higher than QN, and uh, again, the difference is highly significant. So what we end up with is a situation where now we can estimate that um, households that participate are much more likely to tell their neighbors, perhaps not surprising, but we do also find that once you hear about things, you don't really care what your neighbors are doing. Okay, so you're not paying attention to what your neighbors are doing. That's not influencing in a significant way your decision to participate or not. And that, so it means that, you know, having, I, it is true that when you look in the data, if I have more friends who are participating, I'm more likely to participate. But that's happening because if I have more friends who participate, I'm much more likely to hear about it. They're much more likely to pass the information to me. Okay, so that's what's happening in the model. And interestingly, let's suppose that we hadn't fit a diffusion model. So we didn't go through a diffusion model and we didn't actually fit it. But instead, what we did is we just did a regression, the regression to participate based on how many friends, and we just looked for a peer effect. If you did that, you would find a highly significant and positive effect. And what's going on here is it's saying that the reason that you think that it looks like my decision is highly correlated with my neighbor's decisions is because if they participate compared to not participating, I'm much more likely to hear about it. And then once I hear about it, in fact, I don't really pay attention to my neighbors. I make the decision on my own. So once we've taken care of this, then this effect completely disappears. Um, in effect, uh, it flips signs um, in the estimate, um, but it, it, it goes to becoming insignificant. Okay, so um, that tells us something about things. Um, network effects, significant information passing parameters. Information depends on whether you participate. It's more likely if you don't participate. 
Um, slight complementarities, if anything, they're actually negative, um, but they're insignificant. Okay. Now, one thing we can do once, what's the advantage of using a model like this and fitting a model of diffusion? Um, we could actually ask the question now, how important are non-participants in affecting the eventual diffusion? Okay, why, why, why do, you know, do non-participants really matter? Well, there's only 0.05 compared to 0.35 of the, for the participants. So what, you know, do they really play any role? So what we can do is it, we can ask, what if the world were such that it's exactly the same world, but non-participants didn't talk? Okay, so we'll just make that change. So what, happened, what would happen if non-participants went from 0.05 to zero? Uh, how much would that affect the world? So is 0.05 really, does that matter much, or should we just ignore it? Is, it? is it really close to zero? So it's statistically significant, but we don't know if it makes a big effect. So we can rerun the model with qn equals zero, keeping everything else constant. And what that does is it says, what, is, what would happen in a world where it's exactly as what we measure, but non-participants just didn't talk? Okay? So we're not rerunning the model that way. We're, we're sticking with the model we have and the, the estimates we have and just asking, what would happen if these people were just shut up and, and not allowed to talk? Okay? And if you do that, so if you run the model um, with the original parameters, actually, sorry, this is a typos here. We got the 0.05 and 0.35. Um, and instead, you run this um, to uh, 0 0.0 and 0.35. What happens is the informed rate in the full model, we end up with 86% informed. That drops down to 58.9%. The participation rate at 21% drops down to about uh, 14%. So we get about a, a one-third drop in both of these, right? So we end up with a one-third drop um, if, if we end up uh, dropping out this uh, par non-participants talking. They actually account for about a third of the overall informedness and a third of the eventual participation rate. So what we end up finding, we get significant information passing parameters, insignificant and limited peer uh, effects. Information passing depends on whether you participate. <clears throat> And non-participants play a substantial role. They account for about a third of the overall um, informativeness in the society. Um, you know, you can use different networks. So we used every network in this. Um, you could say, okay, let's suppose we just, you know, which networks are actually the best for using models. If you use, uh, instead of using all networks, you just use the money, uh, borrowing money, borrowing kerosene and rice networks then what you actually find is that um, in, in terms of uh, looking at the, the differences between uh, what happens in that model and what happens in the other model, um, you end up with uh, a situation where if you look at the objective function, um, the objective function actually goes up. Uh, you get a better fit when you use the money, kerosene, and rice as opposed to all the networks. So it, it appears that some of these other networks are actually um, not very good predictors, and if anything, adding noise to the estimation, and these seem to be more important networks. Um, so you can do things like that. So conclusions, if you use one of these diffusion models, this is just an example of how you might fit a diffusion model to data. And what it can, allowed us to do in this particular setting was disentangle information from complementarities. Um, we found information passing looked significant, but then peer effects were not uh, appearing to be significant given the model and given what we're doing. Um, Non-participants appear to be important in the diffusion process. Um, they're, uh, you know, less than, uh, much less likely, somewhere between five and ten times, depending on which variation of the models you fit, um, to uh, pass information along. Um, but they still, uh, there's many of them, and they still account for about a third of the eventual um, diffusion in this uh, setting. Okay, so that was an example of, <clears throat> excuse me, an example of how we can fit a diffusion model to data. And, uh, you know, simulation techniques are going to be very useful, <clears throat> basically, in, in allowing us to fit a, a much wider variety, a much wider variety of, of models to data and to work with things that we can't solve analytically. So there's no way to find a closed form solution for what the eventual diff diffusion rate is going to be under a model that's this complicated.
And so we've enriched the model from, say, the SIR, the SIS models. The ones we were looking at before were just looking at component structures or um, steady state distributions of very simple models and variations on the BAS model. Now we've got something which is more complicated and depends on people's characteristics and depends on whether they depart, depend to part, uh, decide to participate. But by being very careful and using simulations, we can actually learn a lot from those kinds of models. And so here what I want to emphasize is the techniques that we can work with these models. They're quite tractable when you work with simulation and data. They couple together. We can learn a lot about what's going on. And so this is a, a useful technique for, for analyzing diffusion. So that, that uh, we'll, we'll say a little more in, a, in our closing on diffusion, and then we're going to start turning to learning.